The Canola School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by BSF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. here with realagriculture.com. I am back here today with another Canola School episode and I have here with me Megan Van Kosky who is a field crop entomologist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada based in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. How's it going today? Really good. We survived the blizzard yesterday so can't complain. Absolutely. So you recently spoke at Agronomy Update in regards to the impact of heat and drought on insect pests of prairie crops. Do you want to touch a bit on uh, what some of your main points were? Absolutely. Um, We've had a lot of questions since last summer just about how the period of rather intense heat and the prolonged drought that we had last summer could affect insect populations. And so in my agronomy update presentation, I kind of walked through some different predictive models and talked about the biology of the different major crop pests, just to give an idea of how heat and drought could have an impact on those populations. And some insects do quite well in hot, dry conditions and others don't. And so it's kind of a a mixed bag of good news and bad news for crop production, depending on what you're growing and what insect pests you're dealing with. Now, when we're, like you said, it really depends when we're looking at different crops. For this uh, specific episode, we are focusing on canola. Canola, I mean, really struggled last year if, if it was if it was any in these dry areas. So some of the, uh, some of the insects you talked about were flea beetles. Do you want to elaborate a bit on what you found? Yeah, absolutely. So based on a lot of the biology and uh, other research that we've done on flea beetles, we know that the the two major species that we deal with on the prairies, the striped flea beetle and the crucifer flea beetle, respond differently to hot and dry conditions. So crucifer flea beetles do quite well when it's hotter and drier, and striped flea beetles actually prefer it to be cooler and wetter. So in, in prolonged drought, and and hot conditions, we might actually see a decline in that striped flea beetle population, at least in the, and in their pest status as a result of that. Um, Whereas crucifer flea beetles are likely to respond in the opposite way and maybe become more of a problem in drought and hot conditions. So to just to take a step back, you are looking at some of these forecasting maps and based on the models you're predicting, are you looking at any specific temperatures or like, you know, if you say these conditions prolong, what what's your base there? Really great question. So the, the models that I presented at Agronomy Update and we'll have some of the maps to, to show your audience here, um, those are based on the average current climate, which... Um, So over the last 30 years, the average conditions and then the hotter and drier conditions that I'm talking about are two degrees hotter and 40 percent drier than that 30 year average. And and of course, these are predictive models. Um, So what we're seeing or what we're predicting from those is really what we would see over a period of a few hot and dry years. So insects take time to respond. Um, Some might respond very quickly in one growing season, but others take a few growing seasons to respond. And so it's really just looking at those trends and what could be happening. The overall point of looking at those maps is to really see just like, do they respond in, in a positive or a negative way to those changes in climate? So when we're looking at flea beetles, for example, what sort of, um, how do they react to the long term? Are they very season to season or how do they work that way? So flea beetles only have one generation per year. So we would expect that um, last year, for example, if we had um, quite active populations of striped striped flea beetles in the spring, then over the course of the growing season, being that it was hotter and drier, they could have had a negative response to that, had uh, less reproduction, um, less emergence to the new generation adults later in the summer. And so then there could be fewer striped flea beetles next season as a result of that. Um, So that's kind of the, the predictive process is just over that period of a year or two, 
based on the length of their developmental period and number of generations per year, what are the, the possible trends in those populations and their impacts. Now, another one you looked at when we think hot and dry on the prairies, we unfortunately typically think grasshoppers. Uh, grasshoppers do eat canola as well. It's not, we, t- we typically think of just it being on wheat, but I mean, if anyone's seen grasshoppers, they do really like that canola. So uh, what, what are we looking at there? So grasshoppers really, really respond very well to hot and dry conditions. We see that in a sink, this is a species that does only have one generation per year again, but we know from a multitude of research across the prairies by a number of different people that in hot, dry years, grasshoppers develop faster, so they start laying eggs earlier. And over the course of a couple of years of hot and dry conditions, grasshopper outbreaks can build up very quickly. And like you say, they do like canola or they will eat canola. And I think a big part of that is if it's dry, they're looking for water and canola is very nice and juicy. Um, So we do see quite considerable damage to canola crops and to certain pulse crops too. So I know that's not quite on, on point, for this canola school, but a good thing to keep in mind. So yes, um, over the course of a few years of hot and dry conditions, we might see a buildup in grasshopper populations leading to quite widespread regional outbreaks. We're still at that patchy outbreak level, but we're trending towards a more regional outbreak with those conditions. Now the regional outbreak that's looking uh, just in your specific region or where? When I'm talking regional in this case, I'm really talking prairie wide. So, yeah, right now it's quite patchy, so we might have an outbreak around Weyburn or around Lethbridge, for example. But over time, we would be building up to that potentiality of having something that's a lot more widespread across the prairie growing region. Now, when you look at maps year to year, I mean, like last year, I know there was all sorts of predictions on grasshoppers that looked like there could be outbreaks and there there was. So when you look at this year and you say outbreak in comparison to last year, how, how does that look? Um, well, I think our grasshopper populations were quite healthy across most of the prairies when we did our annual survey this year. So I think we're seeing more and more area at risk of outbreak densities going into next year. But I think it's important to keep in mind that early season growing conditions can have a huge impact on what actually happens. So if we end up with a really cool wet spring in 2022, um, which would be great for the water table, um, that could actually be terrible for grasshoppers. And then we might not have that outbreak happen. So this is where scouting is really important. It's just, it's very important very valuable to get out in the field and look for the young grasshoppers as they start to emerge and it's easiest to control grasshoppers when they're young as compared to when they're older absolutely okay and the other ones you highlighted were pollen beetle and swede mid do you want to talk a bit about that yeah, just uh, just briefly, these are both insects that we do not currently have established on the prairies. They're not pests here, but they are present in other parts of Canada in the east, and we are always on watch for these as invasive species because they could be quite devastating for canola production. Um, Swede midge especially do not respond well to drought conditions or to really hot conditions, which is a great news story for the prairies that they're based on our models and what we know about their biology. The regions where we expect Swede midge to do well are quite limited in the current growing conditions based on that 30 year average. But if things get hotter and drier, that pest potential pest area really drops to nothing, um, which is a very good news story um, because Swede midge have been just devastating to canola production um, out east. Okay, so the second invasive insect that uh, we could see affecting canola if it becomes established in Western Canada is the pollen beetle. And in the current climate, based on that 30 year average, uh, there's quite a, there's actually quite a large portion of the prairies that could experience damage from pollen beetle infestation. But in a hotter and drier um, climate um, over a couple of years of drought, we actually see their, uh, their region shift northward. Um, to stay where it's a little bit cooler and wetter. Uh, so pollen beetle aren't, um, aren't responding very positively to hot and dry conditions, but 
they're not as uh, sensitive to those hot and dry conditions as the sweet midge are, for example. Okay, and if producers are looking for uh, more on this info, where do they go? So the presentation that I gave at Agronomy Update is available on uh, from the Agronomy Update. The slides are posted. Um, of course, people are more than welcome to send me an email and ask questions. And the Prairie Pest Monitoring Network website is an excellent resource for a lot of this information as well. Okay, sounds good. Anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no, not really. Just uh, I think scouting is more important than we sometimes give it credit for. I know we talk about it a lot, uh, but it is so helpful to know what's happening in your field in order to decide how to manage insect pests and other pests as well. So, Well, yeah. like you said, scouting early season uh, for some of those I insects that actually could impact us later is, is key as well. Absolutely. Yeah. It, like I said, it's easier to kill grasshoppers when they're young nymphs as compared to adults. Um, so the earlier we can take action on some of those species, the better. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you very much for your time, Megan. Great. You're very welcome, Kara. Thanks. <laughs>